All right, uh, let's get going. Revelation chapter 21, we'll read verse 10 through 10 and 18. The first thing that you want to understand about gold, that's what we're going to be covering today in the Bible, is gold. All right, gold, know about the tabernacle, and then what you'll hear is that gold, gold is supposed to represent deity. It's supposed to represent holy deity. And there's a lot of historical background on that. Uh, pretty much even uh, Bible pastors, scholars, and even the liberal secular scholars will all admit that gold it has a place of so many rich, uh, so many rich details about deity. Shine, and then the admiration when you look at it, the quality of its element, and they would connect that to the divine, to the gods, or to God. Uh, scriptural background is filled where if you look at all the references concerning gold in your Bible, especially on the tabernacle, it's something very close to God. And so gold represents deity. And, you know, just a small note, this ain't scripture, obviously, this ain't doctrine, but it is interesting. If you take out the word L in gold, you get God, right? So that's just something I just threw in there. All right, Revelation. That's not scripture, though, all right? There's no verse to prove that. All right, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 10. Now, let's uh, lay down the detail on why gold would represent deity. First of all, heaven's city is all gold. The Bible says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. All right, what comes out of heaven? Its own city in verse 18 18, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. So notice right here that it is all purely gold, heaven city. So we're going to look at Exodus, uh, keep your hand at Revelation, go to 22, 22, and then go to Exodus 28, Exodus 28. Now, we know that heaven city is all gold. And then holiness, it's so interesting, it would be equated with gold as well. And if we were to add 1 plus 1 equals 2 together, it would be pretty obvious. If gold is representing deity, we know that the most important attribute to God is His holiness. So then, it wouldn't be a surprise that holiness would be also equated with gold as well. All right, now look at this. So heaven's city, it's all gold. We know that. And then we also know that deity and holiness is all attributed to gold as well. Now look how all of this connects together. Exodus chapter 28. And notice how your King James Bible words it at verse 36. Verse 36. Thou shalt make a plate of pure gold... Okay, so we're at Exodus 28, verse 36. And grave upon it like the engravings of a signet. So on this plate of pure gold, you're supposed to write on it what? Holiness to the Lord. Now that's interesting. So there's no doubt that God, he puts holiness very close with gold. Uh, he connects it together. But Revelation 22 would be more apparent. Because in heaven, the only people, this is the important note here, which will connect a lot of dots. In heaven city, which is all gold, sinners and sin is not allowed there. Sin is kicked out of heaven's gold there. So it shows that God, he separates the gold from the sinners, but he puts holiness with the gold. So look at Revelation chapter 22, and then we'll look at verse 11. The Bible says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is, notice right here, holy, let him be holy still. But look at who enters inside the city of gold. There's a distinction with the unjust and then the holy, right? At verse 11. All right, who are the ones that go inside the city? The ones who are holy at verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may, look at this, they, the ones who have access are the ones who live in holiness or who keep his commandments. 
may enter in through the gates into the city. See that? Verse 15, for without, those who don't qualify are what? Dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, those that are sinners. See that? So there's no doubt. Gold is the one that would connect to the ones that is holy. And then those that are unholy, God separates the gold from them. Which is why it makes so much sense in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come what? Short of the glory of God. Why? Because they fall short of God's glory in heaven and he puts gold all over heaven. They fall short of the gold as well. This becomes even more apparent when you look at 1 Peter 1.7. 1 Peter 1.7. We fall short of the glory of God. And what God connects something with his glory, something that is holy, what kind of material material or element would be the most ideal that he would use. It would be gold. But look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of what? Gold that perishes. We're more valuable than that. Though it be tried with fire, uh, might be found unto praise and honor and what? Glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's why we all say during preaching or teaching that when we go through suffering, we come out more than fine gold. Gold tried in the fire. But then what God mentions right here is that when you go through that fire, uh, it's for His glory as well. That, why? You're that gold that's tried in the fire during suffering for Him to manifest His glory. That should be something right here. One thing I learned is that sometimes when you go through some of the deep meats in doctrine, you'd be surprised that in some areas right here, well, like you would take your own Christian life more seriously, right? You would go, wow, I didn't know that. So I got to live better for him. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is even way more apparent. We're not going to turn there, but if you know that passage, what did the Bible say about your good works and your bad works at the judgment seat of Christ? Your bad works, when they go to the fire, they get burned up. Right. But if those works are not as sinful or as bad as your bad works, and they're really good or holy, then what do they turn into? Gold. Gold. See that? So there's no doubt when you look through all these scriptures, holiness is connected to gold, and sin is separated from that one. God doesn't want to put sin with gold right there. Uh, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And then we'll look at verse 7. Genesis chapter 2. And then we'll read verse 7. Now, you may have heard a crazy old man, and of course he doesn't know what he's talking about, that Adam, when he was created, you know, he had a golden image, you know. Or maybe he knew something to that book that was way ahead that maybe some of us, you know, took a little bit more time to catch up, right? All right. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. One thing I learned is that when uh, the Lord uses some preacher or God's man to teach you something or preach to you something, don't, don't get all prideful, arrogant, and then dismiss it so easily. I'm not saying for you to believe it easily either, okay? But you've got to, uh, one thing I've learned, especially when you hear preaching, the temptation is to critique constantly. And if you do that, then you're not going to spiritually learn or spiritually grow. Just take it what it is, and if it's meat, let it sink in until the digestion finally goes through when the Lord sees fit, okay? That's it, all right? All right, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God for man of the dust of the ground. So Adam, we know that he was created from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, Dr. Ruckman, what he would claim is that this was actually golden dust where Adam came from. And the reason why is because verses 10 through 12, Adam, he was created at a ground. He was created from a ground nearby Eden. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. 
There is bdellium and the onyx stone. So in this land of Havilah, there's gold. Now nearby the Garden of Eden, Dr. Ruttman's point is that near the Garden of Eden, there is terrain, there is a terrain that has gold. If Adam was created at a ground nearby the Garden of Eden, then we would say that he was created with gold dust. But um, let's just put that as a perhaps for now. Now remember, when we go through deep doctrine, it's not just one verse. You look at all these other verses, and then you're going to get an answer more clearly. You may not get a 100% answer, but you're going to get it more clearly. That's what's going to happen. Uh, so let's think about this. Suppose, suppose Adam was created with a golden image from the ground nearby Eden. It would probably make sense then. Why? Because he didn't have a sinful nature that time. Now remember in heaven, sinners aren't allowed. If you have sin, you can't enter heaven's gold. You can't enter that golden city. You could probably make sense. Adam was in a holy state without sin. Holiness is connected to gold. So perhaps. So let's think about that logic, okay? If we look at right here again, gold is what? It's a holy state without sin. So let me add this too, okay? Sometimes we need to see it in writing or in picture so that we can get it, right? <laughs> Sometimes that is necessary. Okay? Okay, so we see how gold is connected right here. Okay, it's without sin and holiness is connected to it. Think about uh, some of these other factors. If Adam, if, I say if, he was created with the golden image, it could answer the question that you've all learned before. Why did the Bible say he lost the image of God when he sinned? When he sinned. He lost something important. The Bible says God's image, unless it was gold, maybe it's connected to that. That's why it would word something like that. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, all right? This will become even more interesting. All right, let's build. These are just thoughts that I'm throwing in, and then you, let's just add all of this together then. Then it could connect, and it would answer so many other questions. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then we'll look at verse 49. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then we'll look at verse 49. Okay, now we know this is that, praise the Lord, that when we got saved, the image of God was restored. So if you're saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the image of God is restored. But if you're lost, you do not have the image of God. And then the scriptures, uh, I've taught you that before, so I'm not going to do it again. Just take it for granted. But 2 Corinthians 4, 4 is a great example of that. If you're lost, you do not have the image of God, actually. The devil blinded you from that, lest you get the image of God, right? Lest Christ can give you that image. That's why the devil's job is to prevent you from getting that, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. But anyway, the point is right here is that when we got saved, the image of God is restored, right? We get that. But look how it ties to something very interesting to gold. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the what? Heavenly. Okay. So 1 Corinthians 15 says we're going to bear the image of the heavenly. Now, we know that ties to your rapture, praise the Lord, at verse 52. At the rapture, we get that incorruptible body, right? So we're going to get the heavenly image. Verse 52 is your rapture. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So we're going to get that heavenly image when we go to heaven. All right, we're going to get that heavenly image when we go to heaven. Why? You need that image to go to heaven. Hmm. Now, it becomes more evident when the Bible shows our heavenly image is like the stars at verse 41 through 42. Look at verse 41 through 42. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and, a glor and another glory of the stars. 
For one star differeth from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. That's our rapture. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in in corruption. All right, so our heavenly image is going to be like the stars. Now, get this, all right? Hey, I mean, something that uh, scientists took years later to catch up. Didn't you know? (laughs) So interesting that stars are made out of gold. Didn't you know gold? Scientists, they try to find out where do we get so much gold in the universe, they say. Didn't you know that? Yeah, scientists teach that. It only took them 1,900 years to catch up. That's how, our, our, how advanced our scientists are. You know, Praise the Lord for such geniuses, right? These are the guys that taught you your great, 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 great ancestor was from a rock or a monkey, all right? Only took them 1,900 years. Give them a little bit credit, right, you know? So... When you, uh, this is found at the article by Rafi Letzer. Too much, there's too much gold in the universe. No one knows where it come from. Well, I know where it came from, but this is from Live Science, October 1st, 2020. All right, this is how they mention it right here. So this is what they mentioned. They tried to mention that all this gold, where it would come from, is from the stars then out there. But they say it's too rare when these stars would burst out. But not when, if you know your Bible, that we're going to be like, if our rapture is going to be like the stars, and it's going to be innumerable in number, Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. And not only that, the angels are likened to stars too. But anyways, okay, let's just go back over here. During a magneto-rotational supernova, a dying star spins so fast and is racked by such strong magnetic fields that it turns itself inside out as it explodes. As it dies, the star shoots white hot jets of matter into space. And because the star has been turned inside out, its jets are chock full of gold nuclei. But gold remains an enigma. Something out there that scientists don't know, that's what you get when you don't believe there is a God. See, you, you, you never have your questions answered. You don't know. Something out there that scientists don't know about must be making gold. Kobayashi said, or it's possible neutron star collisions make way more gold than existing models suggest. In either case, astrophysicists still have a lot of work to do before they can explain where all that fancy fancy bling came from. It's simple. Just go to a Dollar Tree store. Buy yourself a King James Bible. There you go. Problem solved. All right. All right. then. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. That's why it makes sense. The Bible says we're going to shine as the stars. How about that? Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Now this is making a lot more sense now. See that? All of this is starting to make a lot more sense. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. So if Adam uh, had the image of God, and then obviously the saved people have the image of God, our image as saved people will be like the heavenly stars. And remember, the stars are chock full of gold. So then, yeah, it's possible. And it's like these gold little dust or nuclei or whatever they called it, right? Then maybe the old man wasn't too far when he said Adam was created from gold dust. All right, then. Uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. The Bible says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. How about that? Isn't that interesting? Stars that will shine, but Satan likes to replace the stars that shine. That's why he has the Hollywood stars putting their stars on the pavement, on the streets, trying to make it look gold when it's, it's not even pure gold itself. They attend Golden Globes. See that? And they want to get Oscars that look like golden images, when our image that we're going to get is going to be gold. How about that? See that? All of this is just starting to make more sense now. And that's why, because the Hollywood stars, they like these golden images for their Oscars, and it's not even real pure 
100% genuine gold itself. And th you, you see these actors, actresses crying over some fake gold piece. Like, this is what they sweated and died for, man. People die in Hollywood. I kid you not. Actors, actresses just die just for this dumb little thing. Like you heard your preacher said that it's going to rot in a garage or something, right? Man, but Satan loves those golden images, don't he? Revelation 9, 20. That's why he has his golden images. Revelation 9, 20. Revelation 9, 20. Everything Satan does, you know, he always tries to mimic God. He tries to imitate God. Why? Because he just wants to one-up on Jesus Christ. Like, well, if you couldn't do that, I can do a better one. So he always copycats him. We know that. Look at Revelation chapter 9 and verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols. See that? Of gold. Uh, look at Exodus 32. Exodus 32. And then Ezekiel 28. Exodus 32. And Ezekiel 28. Exodus 32, uh, Exodus 32 and Ezekiel 28. Now you notice in this uh, church, we don't take like 20 different modern versions and only go on one Bible verse and everybody don't sink in on the same verse in that one verse and then they just give a little ditty devotional and they're done. You know, that's how much lack of Bible they had. It's so sad. They not only just cover one or two verses, they have multiple versions. So basically, they get zero Bible then. See that? That's very sad. That's the sad state of our churches today. If they would only have a pure Word of God and just keep getting that Word of God and go with so many scriptures, my goodness, that Word of God will blow up your mind every single time. All right, let's look at Exodus chapter 34. Uh, 32, excuse me, and verse 3, Exodus 32, verse 3. That's why Satan, he likes that golden calf, right? He likes the golden calf, a golden image. Verse 2, Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings. And what happened? If you look at uh, verse 3, and all the people break off the golden earrings. Verse 4, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with the graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. So he made a golden calf, a golden calf. Satan not only likes golden images, he likes a golden calf. Why? He used to be that golden ox up in heaven. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. We'll look at verse 13. Verse 13. This is, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, that's pretty obvious. That's Satan. Every precious stone was I covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. So notice right here, Satan, he is made out of gold. It was his covering. Verse 14, thou art the anointed what? Cherub. All right, that proves he's the ox. What, what do you mean that proved he's the ox? Well, I'm not going to show you in the other verses, but I showed you many times in Bible study, so it will be repetitive. But if you look at Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10, you'll find out that cherub means ox. All right, I'll just leave it right there. Now you go home and do your Bible study, all right? <laughs> all right, so that's what you're going to find out real fast with these four living creatures. And then one of them is called cherub. But then Ezekiel replaces it later on with ox. So it's the same thing. But anyway, Satan is called ox. Ezekiel 28. But then he, they mention he's made out of gold. That would make a lot of sense why Satan likes this golden calf in Egypt. And the children of Israel, I don't know why. They just keep making golden calves, right? Oh, why do you have to always put a cow in there, you know? Why do you have to do that? Unless there's something strange behind it. Unless there's a demonic mindset behind it. Unless Satan likes something. Well, just look at the scriptures. Let it show you, right? All right, let's look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Now here's something really interesting. 
Now we're going to talk about the elements of gold, the elements of gold. Didn't you know that gold absorbs light really well? Now, there's no doubt from the previous things we learned that gold would mean holiness and sinners are separated from gold. At least that much we can agree upon when we see the scriptures. There's two, that holiness is tied to gold and sin is separated from gold. At least we can agree that much. But this becomes even more apparent when realizing God is light. So, because if we have the golden image, we can absorb God's light really well because God is light. But who can't absorb that light really well? Darkness. Who is darkness? Lost sinners. That's why they cannot function. They will not survive in heaven. They cannot absorb God's light. They cannot absorb God. Why? Too much holiness. And they have too much sin. Look at John chapter 1 verse 4. John chapter 1 verse 4. Look at this. The Bible says right here. Let me turn the page here. In him was life and the life was the what? Light of men. All right. We're able to get that light now. Once we got saved, we received life. And the light shineth in darkness, and the what? Darkness comprehended it not. The lost world cannot comprehend that. They cannot sink in their head. That's why you can sink in the preaching, the teaching, and then the doctrines and other stuff better than the lost world. Sometimes the Bible says a natural man, lost man, cannot receive the spiritual things of God. Why is that? Because the reason why is... Uh, you got the image of God restored in you. You got the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 ties that image to what? The light as well. But then the devil, he blinds the world and that darkness can't take it in. Why? Darkness cannot go in with light. It just doesn't work that way. That's why the spiritual things of God can't sink in with the lost world. It makes more sense now why God would liken all these things together. Look at Luke 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. One thing I've learned is this, is that once you get one of those uh, uh, deep doctrines in, even the simple verses that we've all memorized and we read through a thousand times and we go, oh, I know, I know. No, you don't know. Yeah. You'd be surprised, John 3, 16. You, some of you still just don't get that verse yet. And then you'd be surprised that when you read your Bible the 10th time, 20th time, the 30th time, and then especially when you get into a deeper doctrine, then you might go, wait a minute, that reminds me of what? The verse that you memorized before? The verse that you hid in your heart before? And then you're going to go, oh, that's what it means over there. All right, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. This book is endless. And no matter how deep we go, we'll only scratch the surface. We will never reach ever. This book is endless. No book is like this book. And this book is unlike any other book where it doesn't need revising like science textbooks. Oh, excuse me. You got your modern scholars who think that it needs to be revised. Because we heard from the preaching, right? When they put their understanding in, rather than letting God's understanding flow, flow from the words itself, you're going to miss out a lot. All right, look at Luke chapter 10. Isn't that amazing? 1611, man. Well, let's go back to the original Greek, man. Go, go back to the uh, first centuries. Never change, bro. It's, man, amazing. Man. Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. Gold is also a good conductor of electricity, actually. God is light, but Satan, he's obviously rejected as light. Why? Because he's darkness. You ever heard that phrase from that preacher? Light rejected becomes what? Lightning. You've heard that quote before from some preacher? Hence, Satan has a hold on gold through what? Electricity, lightning, rather than light. Look at Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And that's why Satan, all he can do is imitate, you know, morph, transform. That's why the Bible says he is transformed as an angel of light. He's fake. He's fake light. All right. Here's another interesting thing about gold. It can become red liquid like blood, 
when its nanoparticles are in colloidal suspension in water. Isn't that interesting? Didn't you know there are also other interesting terms called gold veins and gold blood? You, have, you ever heard of those terms before? It's interesting. Gold blood is actually referring to a very rare blood type that I don't know if you've heard about before. It's Rh null blood. And this blood, all right, I, uh, if, you, if you get this, you can run the bases if you want. This gold blood is basically a universal blood type that just fits for all blood types around the world. I don't know if you got that one. All right. Like the preacher said, right? It just went over the head, right? You know? <laughs> All right. Let's look at some interesting verses here about gold, gold being connected to blood. 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Do you ever wonder why uh, your gold comes out more fine when you go through suffering? Hmm, you thought of that before? They're tied. They're tied. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Out of all elements in the universe, God picks gold as the comparison to the blood of Christ that is universal for all person types. He didn't pick like brass or stone. Now, he picked silver too, but I'm not going to mention that part. I'm gonna, that's going to be interesting, all right? So let's just forget that for now. But I'll show you why silver is tied later, okay? But he didn't pick stone or anything else. He picked gold for a reason. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Wow, now look at 1 Peter 1.7. 1 Peter 1.7. Now that's a universal blood over there that goes into any person and not even Calvinists can kick that out. It's not a specific elect or a specific blood type. It's for everybody out there, everybody out there, that the Lord would give them the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a universal blood type. So interesting that out of all the elements in the universe, he would pick gold as a comparison for his comparison where it would pale to the blood of Christ being a much more valuable commodity and element. Now, let's look at 1 Peter 1.7. We read this verse that the trial of your faith, right? Suffering being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. See that? When you suffer blood, when you go through suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ, when you shed blood for His name, uh, the Bible shows how all of that is considered to be fine gold to Him. Look at Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13. Not just the saved Christians, but the children of Israel as well. The children of Israel. Go to Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13. The children of Israel as well. Zechariah chapter 13. That's why God has to put them through that bloody persecution at the tribulation so that he can reign down as king. Why? They have to get some sins, iniquities cleaned up. Uh, if you know Daniel 9, God gave them 70 weeks to fulfill the transgressions, the iniquity as a nation. And then once they fulfill that at the tribulation... Then look at what God words that as. Look at Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. They come out as more fine gold. Zechariah le chapter 11, we'll look at verse 12. And I said unto them, if ye think good, uh, no, excuse me, uh, I looked at the wrong verse here. Zechariah 13, sorry, Zechariah 13, I'm sorry. Zechariah 13, verse 8, verse 8, verse 8. The Bible says here, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, Two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. So that's a prophecy about the tribulation, all right? When the tribulation goes through the suffering, persecution of the Antichrist. During this persecution, the third that goes through that fire, goes through that suffering and survive, the Bible says in verse 9, and I will bring the third part through the fire, 
kind of like 1 Peter 1 about the Christians. And will refine them as silver is refined and will try them. Try, like 1 Peter 1, the trial of your faith going through the fire. As what? Gold is tried. How about that? God connects the suffering blood for his name with gold. Look at Matthew 20. This is even more interesting. Matthew 20. Matthew chapter 20. This could answer, all right, so I say it could answer. I'm not saying it's a solid answer. But some people ask me, why would it, uh, why did God pick specifically Moses and Elijah for the two uh, uh, olive, uh, the olive sticks that are on the right and the left hand of Jesus Christ for that uh, golden candlestick? Why would God pick Moses and Elijah? And I couldn't answer that question but maybe now I found an answer. This is interesting. Look at Matthew 20. Somebody wanted to get the right and left hand of Jesus rather than Moses and Elijah. But what did Jesus say the qualification was? Do you recall? Matthew chapter 20. It's suffering. Matthew 20. And then verse 21. The Bible says, And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other in thy left in thy kingdom. All right, she's talking about at Zechariah, we're going to look at that later, where God has two people on, uh, or the two witnesses, one on his right hand, one on his left hand. And we know they are Moses and Elijah. But let's keep reading here, all right? Verse 22, But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what he asked. Why? He's giving them... He's asking her, giving the qualifications, are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? That's the baptism and that's the cup referring to suffering. We all know that. They say unto him, oh, we are able. It's just like you during altar call. Oh, I'm able. You know, I'm able. And Jesus is like, nah, I don't think so. And then he's like, sure, you'll get it then at verse 23. He saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit, <laughs> but he doesn't give it to them, <laughs> but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. We know who they are, Zechariah. Now, verse chapter 4, Zechariah 4. We know they are Moses and Elijah. But look what the Bible worded this as. Look at this now. It ties to suffering. Zechariah chapter 4. So we see that it ties to suffering at Matthew 20. But guess what God calls these two witnesses? One on the right hand, one on the left. He calls it, he poured golden oil on it and a golden uh, candlestick. That's what he called these olive things. That's what he called it. Zechariah chapter 4. And we'll read verse 11. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? Right? That's what Matthew 20 is referring to. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches? Look at the wording here. Which through the two golden what? Pipes. Empty the golden oil out of themselves. That golden oil goes, at verse 14, anoints. Anoints those two witnesses, verse 14. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. How about that? You got your answer there. So gold, the reason why Jesus Christ didn't give it to them it's because he said, you have to get that baptism of suffering then. Why? Why do you have to get baptized with the suffering? Because to get on the right hand and the left hand, you have to get that anointing of gold right there. Isn't that what the verse shows right there? Golden pipes, golden oil poured out, and they are the anointed ones, hence. Gold, that's why. Recall Zechariah 11, 1 Peter 1, how you come out more fine gold to God. You have to go through that fiery suffering for him. And then if you know your Bible about Moses and Elijah, what did the Bible say? The Bible says Moses, he chose suffering, chose suffering for the affliction of his people, not the wealth of Egypt. 
And then the Bible talks about Elijah, where he went through so much suffering that he said, Lord, you know, uh, no one's serving God except me. And God's like, no, no, I have plenty of hundreds of others that you just didn't know about. But see, that's why God chose Elijah too. Why? These are the two that went through immense suffering for him. That would make sense. All right. That's why you hear a lot of preaching nowadays about, you know, when you want that anointing of God, that power of God, that filling of God, or, you know, you, you know not what you ask. You better be careful of that. You know what you're getting, right? You're getting trial. You're getting suffering. Why? Because that flesh needs to be crucified more. It needs to be more dead so that the Holy Spirit can fill out and pour out more out of your life. All right, let's look at uh, another passage here. We're going to look at uh, Revelation 15. Revelation chapter 15. Look at Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15, and then we'll look at verse 2, verse 2. Now remember, uh, we are Christians who become more fine gold. Why? Uh, why? Because we've been tried through the fire, right? If we gold is the thing that can withstand fire. That's the thing. That's why at the judgment seat of Christ, gold is the one that comes out of the fire at the judgment seat of Christ, not your bad works. Then it would make sense why we can go to heaven and withstand it. You know why? That floor, that sea of glass in heaven has fire on it. Look at Revelation 15, 2. Revelation 15, 2. If we come out as gold for God, we can come out. We can withstand that. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with what? Fire. And then that had gotten the victory over the beast, etc. See, heaven's floor, sea of glass, is mingled with fire. How about that? When you have that golden image, when you get saved and raptured up in heaven, that's why you can withstand and walk on the fires. But I wonder who did that too before he fell. Ezekiel 28 again. Ezekiel 28, before he fell, he was able to do that too. Ezekiel 28. And then we'll look at verse 14, Ezekiel chapter 28. And then we'll read verse 14. Notice that Lucifer also was the one. Look at the last part of verse 14. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. How about that? Uh, look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. I told you there was going to be a lot. Okay. Daniel chapter 2. I'll try to condense it as best as I can. Daniel 2. Now, there's going to be three passages, all right? There's going to be three passages. All right, get ready. Daniel 2 and Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Daniel 2 and Ephesians 2. The next one is 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. All right, I'm going to repeat it again. Daniel 2, Ephesians 2. And then 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3. All right, now this is interesting right here. Notice that Satan, when he builds up something with his kingdoms, right? He built up his kingdoms on the earth. It was through Nebuchadnezzar and then Persia, Greece, and then Rome. So those are the worldly kingdoms, the kingdom of Satan. And that's why Satan tried to offer that to Jesus, right? I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world in a moment of time. I'll just give them up to you like that. So we know Satan's in charge of these kingdoms. So let's look at his image of golden head, huh? Daniel chapter 2, you know that. Daniel chapter 2. And then we'll look at verse uh, 37. Thou Thou, O king, Daniel 2.37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, Nebuchadnezzar. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Notice that he calls it glory right here, right? At verse 30, uh, verse, uh, whoa, what was I reading? I look, uh, thank you. All right, I'm lost. 37. Connects it to the gold. Verse 38. The last part of verse 38 says, Thou art this head of gold. That's why. All right, but uh, what happens? It falls apart through a stone at verse 45. 
Verse 45, it falls apart through a stone. Verse 45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. Who is that stone? All right, go to Ephesians 2. Who is that stone? So, uh, one by one here, the, Nebuch, uh, the image of Nebuchadnezzar falls apart. It's a head, it's Satan's image, and he has a golden head over here, but that gold head of the image of Satan falls apart through a stone. And this stone lays a foundation start for you to build up gold on top of it. Ah, look at this, all right? Look at this, look at this. You read it a million times. You just weren't paying attention, all right? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. And are built, something's built on top of this, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the what? Cheap cornerstone. We know that. That stone is Jesus Christ that knocks down that golden image that Satan built because we're building on top of that. Jesus is the foundation, isn't it? Right? He's the cheap cornerstone. All right? Now look at this. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. You remember that passage, right? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. Verse 11. For other what? Foundation. Can no man lay than that is lay, which is what? Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, blah, 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 etc., etc., the verse says. How about that? Now it makes more sense why Satan is mad at you. Why Satan wants to destroy you? Because he built his kingdom right here. And God just puts a little stone and knocks it off and let weak human beings who are far weaker than the devil. And you don't even have a piece of gold in your pocket, but we're able to build gold on top of that. You don't think Satan's mad at you after that? How about that? All right, Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. Now let's talk about the silver. All right. Now, Dr. Upman, he mentioned that silver is always associated with gold. All right. And then I'm like, yeah, it does. Common sense. But no, 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 you're missing out. All right. So I was just studying a little bit more and I'm like, my silver is associated with gold. And you're like, what do you mean? You'll get it. You'll get it. All right. Exodus chapter 30. This is cool stuff, man. Exodus chapter 30. Now, for some of you uh, who don't know, when you study the tabernacle, you'll hear that gold is connected to deity. All right. There's no doubt about that. We saw too many verses on that one. Okay. Yeah. Holiness without sin. It doesn't. It def and heaven where God lives. There's no doubt. It connects to deity. Gold is deity. Silver is supposed to represent redemption. Redemption. So I don't know if some of you have heard about that before. And the reason why is because of these following verses, all right? It's talking about basically redemption. Wait, when you think about redemption, what's the first thing on your mind? You're talking about a soul that's bought back by Jesus Christ. We know that silver is associated with gold, but it's in inferior to it in the Bible. Why is that? Unless it's a redeemed soul that associates and can live side by side with God up in heaven, even though we are inferior to him. We are the chief of sinners. Makes you want to run the aisle after that, man. A deep doctrine like that can make you, yeah, man. <laughs> Look at, uh, here, let's look at it one by one, all right? Exodus chapter 30, all right? Exodus chapter 30 and verse 12. Notice how silver is representing ransom, buying back redemption. Verse 12. When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul, 
unto the Lord. Oh, why would the King James Bible put that there? You know, you could put body. Why do you put soul over there? Oh, man. Uh, look at verse 13. This they shall give everyone that passeth among them that are numbered. Half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. For some of you who don't know, shekels, usually they are made out of silver. All right? For some of you who didn't know that. And the half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Why would it say that? Verse 15. Look at the wording here. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. Oh, it just worded it that way. God didn't put a specific instruction like that. When God gave all those rules to the Jews, you are missing a lot of gleaning out there. Oh, man. You can see how much of that pictures your, re your redemption when Jesus bought us, right? All right, let's look at Zechariah 11. Zechariah 11. So we see right here that to purchase a soul, that's silver. Silver has to be paid. This is very plain when you look at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the price and the buying back of the worth of a man. Look at Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. What's the worth of a soul or a man? Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. And I said unto them, if ye think good, give me my price. All right, see the worth of that soul, that man. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. See that? The Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that, look at this, I was prized at of them. See, the worth of that soul, that man, was what? 30 pieces of silver. Look at Psalms chapter 12. Psalms chapter 12. So we know Jesus Christ was sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's how much he was just worth, just that small amount. To Judas Iscariot. But then, you know what that was the price of? That was the price of the great plan of redemption. Uh... We were saved by the word of God, right? The Bible says that being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, right? Well, we got redeemed. We got saved because of that book. Why do you think the Bible says the word of God is tried as silver? Woo! Psalms chapter 12, verse 6. We know that verse. We know it a million times, a million times, you know. No, uh, you got to go to step number one again, right? Like Pastor Donovan Mention, you know, you go A, B, C, D. All right, F, Lord. No, go back to A. Yeah. But I memorized that verse, Lord. No, go back to A. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. I'm such an idiot. Yeah, that's how idiotic we all are, man. Yeah. So trust me, reading through your Bible once is not enough. That's read it right. again. Yeah. Read it again. Yeah. Psalms chapter 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth. Purified seven times. That's why that word of God is known as silver. Because we got redeemed from that book. All right, let's look at Luke. This is even better. Look at Luke 15. This is more evidence. This is probably the greatest evidence. Luke 15. Luke 15. You're that lost one missing piece that God had to find and save. And you know what God called that missing piece? Silver. Luke 15. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of what? Silver. If she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner Amen. that repented. There's no doubt about that. See, we are that silver. We are that silver. Man. And let me tell you something. The Bible, uh, to my knowledge, I could be wrong about this, but I didn't see where the Bible talks about how heaven is decorated, where it mentions silver. It mentioned gold and all the other elements, but mostly gold and all the other elements. But I don't remember reading silver unless we're that silver 
that associates with that gold and God sees us as his silver that just fits right with his gold up in heaven. And that's why silver and gold is always associated in the Bible. Man! <laughs> Glory to God, man! That's just awesome, isn't it? All right, let's look at Isaiah 13 and Revelation 14. Isaiah 13. We're going to look at three passages because i got to finish it now. All right. All right, Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, second one. Revelation 14. Revelation 14. And then the third one, Matthew 3. Matthew 3. All right, let me repeat it again. Re Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13. Revelation 14, Revelation 14, and lastly is uh, Matthew 3, Matthew 3. Now this one is going to be really mind-blowing here, all right? Look at this one. We're going to look at, start off with Isaiah 13 first, all right? So then lost sinners, obviously, we know that lost sinners, uh, they can't go to heaven, they can't go to heaven because they don't have that golden image, so to speak, or they can't survive the light. They cannot produce gold. Uh, they're just fit for the fire, fit for hell. If these lost sinners refuse to become fine gold for the Lord, then what happens? You know what's interesting? There are some verses here that would show that they would be fine gold for an eternal fire for hell then. Look at this one, if you don't believe me. Didn't you know lost sinners are likened to gold? I didn't know that either. But it shows that too. Lost sinners are likened to gold. Look at Isaiah 13, verse 12, verse 12. Uh, well, let's start verse 11 for context, all right? Verse 11. And I will punish the world for their what? Evil. And the who? Wicked for their iniquity. These are lost people. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. See, these are wicked, sinful people. What does God liken that to as? I will make a man more precious than what? Fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge at Ophir. How about that, man? God's going to what? If you uh, look at verse, uh, let's see right here. He mentioned verse 13, what? Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts. When God puts his wrath on these lost, wicked sinners, he's going to say, you're going to become more fine gold for me. What's the wrath of God if you know John 3.36 or Revelation 14? You can turn there if you want to. And then verse 10, you can look at Revelation 14.10, but some of you who already know, you don't have to turn there. You know that wrath of God. That's hell fire. Uh, he that the Son hath life. If you don't have the Son, you don't see life. And then what happens? But the what? Wrath of God abideth on him and guess what that hellfire it does like you know the fire that cleanses to become more fine gold right we learned that right god called hell a cleansing purging process matthew 3 matthew 3 look at matthew chapter 3 verse 12 verse 12 what did john the baptist say about that matthew 3 12 whose fan is in his hand, and he will what? Truly purge, you see that? His floor and gather his weed into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Hell. You know, when the Catholics talk about purgatory, it's like what Jesus told the two, you know not what you ask. I want that baptism of fire, the charismatics. You know not what you ask. Think twice before you say something dumb like that, all right? You know what that is? That's eternal hell fire for a lost soul who dies and burns in hell. Now, you, uh, man, that, this is what you can learn about gold, man. One way or another, you're going to turn out fine gold for him. Why? Whether you go to heaven or to hell, it's all done for the glory of God. God's going to get glory either way, out of your damnation or out of uh, you eternal life with him. He's going to get it either way. What, but the difference with us and Calvinists is you have a choice on that one. So what choice will you make to give God the glory? Yeah. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, what an amazing book. I pray that we'll start laying up and building up gold. You've given us a precious opportunity, but we've wasted so much time on petty things of this world that the devil has put in our eyes. And I pray that we'll focus on, set our affection on things above, not on things on this earth. Satan's trying to blind us with his golden head image. The kingdoms of this world, I'll give it to you moment of time. But Lord, we know that's going to crumble on that stone, that rock. And we're supposed to build a better kingdom than the devil when we can put, build gold on top of that. And the millennium, that's when we're going to reign in our kingdom with you. With that gold, I pray that we'll start working. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we have lunch, okay? I hope you, uh, so you know the routine, if you can. Uh, church, you know the routine. Set up the tables, please. And then uh, uh, put the chairs surrounding it. And before we do that, before we do that, let's pray, all right? I forgot to pray. ask God's blessing on the meal. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on the meal, all right? Father God, uh, we thank you so much for good food to eat, for this time to... Uh, fellowship together. I pray that you'll bless the fellowship, make it sweet, help us to draw closer to each other, but more importantly, to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.